This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University. And today I want to talk about how your Bitcoin can suddenly disappear. This is part two of what we were talking about yesterday when we were talking about a network partition. So I'd encourage you to watch that video first if you haven't seen it already. But it generated a lot of, a lot of questions that I want to answer right now. The basic setup was we have all these undersea internet cables that connect the various continents. And what we wanted to talk about was what would happen if all these cables were severed between uh, North and South America and the rest of the world. So you essentially created an island of North, uh, North America, Central America, and South America. And all the Bitcoin miners did their own thing on this island, while all the Bitcoin miners elsewhere did their own thing. So this is a situation where those underwater internet cables are cut. This could be because of some coordinated uh, global terrorist attack. It could be because of war. It could be some sort of really bad luck where you get natural disasters in the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. It's really just a thought experiment for these purposes though, but we can imagine various versions of a network partition where maybe just your part of the country or your country is separated from the rest of the world. So that's why it's important to think through these things. In this thought experiment, the network partition lasted for just one week. We hypothesized that North and South America, uh, that block would have 80% of the total hash power and would add its blocks to its own version of the Bitcoin blockchain because remember, it can no longer communicate with the rest of the world. Meanwhile, the rest of the world has 20% of the total hash power it starts adding blocks to its own version of the Bitcoin blockchain. So you have the same blockchain up until those cables are cut, up until the network network partition takes place, and then you have these two separate blockchains. You have the North, North South American blockchain, and then you have the rest of the world's blockchain. Under this thought experiment, it's very unrealistic, but we're just gonna assume that after one week, the underwater cables are magically repaired and global internet connection is uh, resumes then the question is which of the these two blockchains is the real bitcoin blockchain which is the real canonical one and as we spoke about part of the nakamoto consensus is that it's always going to be the longer one this is just the way the protocol is designed the blockchain the bitcoin blockchain that has the most accumulated proof of work which will usually be the longer chain that will end up being the real blockchain when you have a reorganization the whole world comes back online and is coordinating with each other. And uh, so all of the miners will choose to mine. At that point, they'll start mining on the longest, uh, on the longest chain. As we said in, the, in yesterday's video, this is probably going to be that North South American Bitcoin blockchain, simply because it had 80% of the hash power before the network partition. And so it was able to uh, presumably over that one week mine a lot more blocks. And so it has the longer blockchain, the blockchain that has mo more proof of work on it. I just want to pause here and say, if you, if you regularly watch my channel but haven't subscribed yet, and there are a lot of you guys, please consider hitting that subscribe button right now. Help me out with the uh, YouTube algorithm. So the, the, the big question that everyone had from yesterday, and I, I should have addressed it, is what happens to all those transactions that were included in the rest of the world blockchain, the one that was just Europe, Asia, and Africa. Uh, so the main blockchain, as history will show, is uh, was the North and South American blockchain. But what's gonna happen to transactions that were mined on the other blockchain, the one in Europe? And the answer is it will be as if these transactions never happened. These transactions will appear to be confirmed over that one week in Europe or wherever. And then when you have the reorg, when the two chains uh, come back together, and again, there's these two blockchains are not going to be merged. There's not going to be some uh, sort of consensus reached on that. The miners will just choose to continue mining on the longest chain. So anything that happened on that Europe, Asia, African uh, blockchain, we might call it the Eurasian blockchain, that those transactions even if they were confirmed over that week, will suddenly become unconfirmed. They'll probably float back into the uh, the mempools, which is the waiting room on all the nodes in Europe and Asia and Africa. And then from there, they'll be sent off globally. They'll be sent to North and South America once the internet connection resumes. And from there, those unconfirmed transactions that used to be confirmed transactions in Europe and Asia and Africa will become unconfirmed transactions. They'll get added back into the waiting room and then they will be included in new blocks after the, uh, the, the network partition is ended. 
So what happens if you happen to buy a car in Europe during that period of time, during that one week using Bitcoin, you, you will still have the car, but your dealer is going to have a problem. Their Bitcoin will no longer exist. It's not as if it's not going to be canceled or something. It's just as if it never existed. So this is, this is obviously a complete mess. Any Bitcoin that were mined as well on that smaller chain, on the Eurasian chain, will also cease to exist after the reorg, after the reorganization. So if there is ever a network partition and you are a Bitcoin miner on the side that has the least hash power, you should definitely turn off your machines, turn off your ASICs and stop mining. Otherwise, you're just burning electricity and any minor block rewards, any transaction fees that you might have collected will disappear after the reorg because they will not exist on that North South American blockchain. So this has, uh, it has one good natural effect, which is incentivizing the one side to stop mining, which is good for the overall Bitcoin ecosystem. So if you're in Europe or Asia or Africa, you should stop mining if there is a network partition and you're pretty sure that you're, uh, you're on the side that has the smaller hash power. Also, if you're, uh, if you're on this, uh, this orphan blockchain, this one that's in Europe and Asia and Africa, you should try not to spend or move your Bitcoin until the network partition is over. Especially, as we said, if you live on that side of the partition that has the smaller hash rate. If you must accept Bitcoin and you're on the Eurasian side, uh, like that European car dealer, you will want to spend it as quickly as possible before the network partition is healed and before there's a reorg. So this is the risk of doing any transactions while there is a network partition. Does this mean that the Bitcoin network and the whole setup is not perfect? I would unfortunately have to say, yes, this is a problem. And many of you were very, very disturbed by this. But again, we have to realize that the real world is a really messy place. And we shouldn't be comparing Bitcoin to some ideal uh, currency system that doesn't exist. We have to compare it to existing real world systems real world alternatives. You're going to use some sort of money. Is it going to be fiat? Is it going to be other cryptocurrencies? Or is it going to be Bitcoin? You, you, you don't really have the choice not to use money and wait until the perfect, uh, the perfect new cryptocurrency descends from the heavens. And uh, people who choose not to use Bitcoin because it does have flaws uh, are really, uh, by default, they're using something else. They're using fiat currency. And so it's, it's very important to compare Bitcoin to the alternatives. And those alternatives are things like banks seizing depositors' money, as happened recently in, uh, in Lebanon, uh, the, bail, the bail-ins in Cyprus, where they confiscated a large percentage of the savings uh, held there, and uh, the constant money printing and inflation that's happening even as we speak. Uh, in the U.S. and it's being blamed on everything except the money printers, which is where it should be blamed. Meanwhile, the cr- cryptocurrencies continue to uh, have problems. Solana went down after a DDoS attack. And so these are, these are the alternatives to Bitcoin. If you're not going to use Bitcoin because you're worried about a network partition and transactions being invalidated after the reorg, you are going to have to use U.S. dollars. You're going to have to use uh, Solana. You could have to use something else. And all of the alter- alternatives to Bitcoin are much worse. Solana brags about having Turing completeness, just like Ethereum, but this means that it's subject to DDoS attacks. This is why Bitcoin has the decision has been made not to make it Turing complete because we don't want to be uh, DDoS. So these are the alternatives to Bitcoin, and you're going to need to pick one of them. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. As the saying is, Bitcoin is the best thing we have so far. Ethereum, Solana, they're not even in the same field. They're not even playing the same game. Vitalik is out hiking with his cat purse while Bitcoiners are hard at work trying to separate money and state. Meanwhile, Vitalik is trying to recreate the existing fiat financial system by moving to proof of stake and creating just another oligarchic system. Under proof of stake, the more money you have, the more influence you have on the protocol. This is not true in proof of work. You could own 50% of the Bitcoin and you still would not have influence over the protocol in the same way as you would under a proof of stake system. Do we really want Cat Purse Billionaire Boy to be our new Jerome Powell in charge of our future monetary policy? We're basically just replacing a guy in a suit with a guy 
it, uh, with a cat purse, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, which is which is worse. Nothing against Vitalik and the cat purse. It just we don't want fallible human beings in charge of a currency because when you have a founder or someone, uh, a CEO of your currency or someone who runs your foundation, that founder or that centralized uh, person is a single point of failure. They can be bribed, they can be threatened, they can be jailed. And so Satoshi really gives a great gift by disappearing. Meanwhile, if you're into Solana because it's faster, even though it keeps getting DDoSed, you should be aware, of course, that billionaire VCs are dumping on you. So these are the alternatives to Bitcoin. If you don't like network partitions, the, the theory that one could happen, you're going to have to use something. Do you really want to use uh, US dollars? Do you want to use uh, Solana? Do you want to use Ethereum instead? Now, here's the good news about network partitions. And I wanted to reassure all of you, if you are a hodler and your Bitcoin is sitting in cold storage, it's not on an exchange, and it's not being moved around while the network is still partitioned, none of this matters. Your Bitcoin will still be yours after the rejoin or the reorg, whatever you want to call it. You don't need to do anything. You just sit on your sit on your uh, private keys. You keep them uh, private, and you uh, hopefully have uh, your your Bitcoin on a on a hardware wallet, either a single sig or multi sig solution. And then when the reorg happens, your Bitcoin is still yours. In fact, doing nothing is actually the best thing you could do during a network partition. So even if you're Rip Van Winkle, you wake up 20 years later, there have been multiple network partitions while you were sleeping, your Bitcoin will still be yours and it will still be easily accessible. If you're holding Ethereum on the other hand, and I like to point this out a lot, um, your Ethereum is probably not gonna be accessible to you after 20 years because there will have been so many hard forks and um, you were sleeping during it. And so uh, you'll have a lot of trouble accessing your Ethereum. Bitcoin, the, the updates are always, um, they're always soft forks, which means they're backwards compatible. And so there's really nothing to worry about. If there's a network partition, it's, de it's definitely a bad idea to be mining on the Bitcoin network at that point, especially if you're on the side with a lower hash rate. It's a bad idea probably to be sending around transactions. It's probably okay to be spending Bitcoin, but you don't want to be receiving Bitcoin uh, because as, as in that theoretical example, you might end up with a car and then the dealer might end up with Bitcoin, which evaporates in his hands. But those are the issues surrounding a network partition. And uh, we have to be very realistic about these things. Bitcoin is going to succeed. It's going to get very big. There are going to be state level attacks against it. And one of those state level attacks could include a network partition. So it's very important to think through how these things would work in a situation like that. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.